This phone is so wacky, so premium and so innovative that it was nipping at the heels of Samsung and Apple upon release, but with one big catch. Today I want to talk about the best phone in the world that the average person couldn't reasonably use when it came out. But before that guys, I'm really trying to hit 100,000 subscribers, so if you wouldn't mind hitting that button, it would mean the absolute world to me. Thank you so much for the recent support, it is massively appreciated. I am of course talking about the fabled Huawei Mate 30 Pro. The US banned the phone from working with Google, so it didn't come with the Google Play services. Or to put it another way, it was very much de googlified No Play Store, no YouTube, no Gmail all built in. And you had to go out of your way to either flash or install Google Play through some dodgy means, or stick with what you had and load every app individually with APKs on online stores like APK Pure or APK Mirror, or use the built-in app gallery. Yeesh. The general public weren't willing to put up with those compromises for the sake of a phone with no volume rocker, but instead a wraparound display that you would slide your thumb up and down, a camera system with a simply huge set of sensors for the time, and some absolutely excellent battery life and charging tech. Believe it or not, and it makes you feel old, it's been five years since this phone was released. And yet in many ways, it seems pretty futuristic still with its ridiculous wraparound display, which is then strangely contrasted by the now very outdated notch at the top. Though it's only so wide so it can accommodate multiple sensors to not only make for great selfie cameras, but actually a more secure face unlock, similar to what Apple does with its Face ID. The screen itself in resolution is only marginally larger than Full HD Plus and was stuck at just 60 hertz but that doesn't stop it looking beautiful in 2024, where much brighter 120Hz QHD Plus displays have become the norm in premium smartphones. I'm sure the first thing you're wondering is, how's the touch rejection? Because people don't like curved displays that aren't this extreme. So how's it gonna work with a wraparound panel? And the answer is honestly, it's not bad. Strangely, it's better than my far less curved screen on the OnePlus 12. While we clearly put work in getting a decent level of touch rejection and I think that's just one example where the firm really tried to make this thing as good as it possibly could be. The design as a whole is really premium and although many lament the circular camera designs these days, this one wasn't huge, it stuck out a tiny little bit from the back of the phone with a pretty small radius as well. The rear finish is absolutely beautiful and it reflects light in really interesting ways, much cooler than the boring colours that we have in 2024. The accented power button is a beautiful touch, and the phone has a bit of character about it, it's not a boring slab. Though this isn't far off the size of sort of a Galaxy S24 Ultra, it feels considerably smaller in the hand, probably thanks to the wraparound sides. It actually measures a hair thicker at its fattest point, which I was astounded to find out, as it really does feel sleek and slender in the hand, especially compared to the S24 Ultra. I use that as a point of comparison because that's the sort of market that Huawei was aiming for with the Mate 30 Pro. And even though this phone is super futuristic looking, Huawei still found space for expandable storage with a dedicated nano memory card slot, which granted was proprietary and could only got to 256GB, but still that's expandable storage. I haven't used any third party tools to get the Play Store working on my model like I did way back when the phone came out and I covered it for Android Authority, and I'm instead just using App Gallery and APK Mirror to get some apps installed, and then use the browser for pretty much everything else. And it's a real shame that you have to go through all of this effort just to install your normal apps, as Huawei was at a point just before lockdown where it was really challenging Samsung and Apple, like the P20 Pro and P30 Pro were phenomenal phones, I've already covered one of those on the channel, it was clearly pushing the competition to one-up each other. We saw innovation, major, major progress in hardware, and we as consumers were all the better for it. Because even if you didn't like the Huawei and didn't buy the Huawei, the Huawei would push the Samsung and the Apple to do better. When the US ruling came out to stop the firm in its tracks over here in the West, it wouldn't be long before improvements stagnated in the industry. And we wouldn't see huge jumps like we did in 2018 and 2019, instead seeing smaller quality of life improvements. One of the key areas Huawei helped progress is the camera hardware, and this had that same 40 megapixel 1 over 1.7 inch RYYB main camera that was genuinely another level in low light, and we'll get to that. But it also had an even larger 40 megapixel 1 over 1.56 inch ultra wide lens, and that looked phenomenal. 
it also had a cut down 8 megapixel 3 times telephoto for a tertiary camera that really couldn't compete with that 5 times optical from the P30 Pro, but it wasn't designed to. It's no surprises that the Mate 30 Pro still takes some beautiful photos. The hardware on offer here is still impressive half a decade later, even if it's not the best on any phone right now. And I clearly have a preference when it comes to camera colours, as this set looks far more natural and almost moody compared to what the competition was offering. And I feel a very similar way about the Hasselblad colours on the OnePlus 12, as I do the Leica ones on the Mate 30 Pro. There's still loads of dynamic range, loads of detail, and a nice amount of natural focus fall off thanks to those big sensors, especially the ultrawide, it's crazy you can get depth of field with this thing. The images almost come out looking like they were taken on a proper camera due to the whole feeling of images just being natural and not over sharpened or over saturated or really crazy overdone HDR. They look sweet, I really really like them. But it's not just the standard one times daylight point and shoot where this impresses. That RYYB sensor basically gives it the ability to see in the dark and even compared to some of the best low light performers in 2024 from Apple, Google, Samsung, the Mate 30 Pro still holds up and it really impresses. This is a super good nighttime camera. Maybe just buy one to hold on to just for that. The 8 megapixel 3x optical zoom is a little bit of a joke compared to the other sensors. It's definitely not horrific, but you do feel like you'd get better shots just cropping in on the main sensor to be honest. Though I'm sure Huawei at the time thought if they were going to charge so much for a phone, it better have some kind of dedicated telephoto and chuck this on there just for that. But perhaps the most overlooked part of this entire camera setup that no one really talks about here is the fact that when you go into portrait mode, not only can you change the amount of portrait blur, which is pretty normal now, but you can pick the shape of the bokeh in the background. This is something I adored on this phone when it came out, and it's seriously underrated. Being able to emulate the look of certain lenses makes for a truly unique portrait mode package. I'm astounded more companies haven't copied since. It's a really cool feature. And sure, the portrait mode cutout isn't perfect every time, but when it does nail it, it looks stunning. And look, it even has a dual tone LED flash for the handful of times you're going to need to use that with such a big sensor. Video might not look nearly as impressive as there's not heaps of dynamic range and the stabilisation tech feels pretty outdated today. But for me, it's made up for by the stills. And you know what? The video isn't that bad. And it really does make you wonder what could have been. The Huawei ban was due to some pretty heavy involvement with the CCP, or supposed, I should say, alleged and its links to infrastructure. For those who don't know, Huawei was and still is a pretty big player in the network hardware game, and that is where much of the West was using it, where now we have the likes of Ericsson taking over, Nokia in there as well, and Samsung also being a big player. Much of the West has been working hard to get rid of this old Huawei stuff and replace it with more trusted systems. Huawei, since this whole debacle, hasn't been able to replicate the magic, and even though I did cover the Mate 40 Pro on release for Android Authority in lockdown, I, I liked what it did, but it was another case of a phone that I just couldn't recommend because of its lack of play services. They'll tell you that Honor is a separate company, but reading between the lines, I'm not sure it even is. And even then, the Honor devices that do come with the Google Play services that you can buy right now are great, but they don't replicate that crazy aura of the Huawei devices that came before them. These things really push the boundaries for hardware and cameras in particular, and Honor just isn't doing that right now. The Huawei Mate 30 Pro had so much potential and could have been a phone that pushed Apple and Samsung to do more in the West. It's a real shame that it went away, and though Honor is cool, it doesn't feel the same. Maybe one day we'll see these guys return to recreate a phone as cool as the Mate 30 Pro.